Hello, welcome to lesson three in our introduction to computer science. This is Brett, and today we're going to continue our lesson on the von Neumann architecture and get a better understanding of how computers work. So if you remember this diagram, we had this idea of input devices, output devices, a central processing unit, and memory. And you've probably heard that computers run on ones and zeros, and that's all they can understand. And that's true because it's an electrical device and it can understand if an electric signal is on or an electric signal is off, and that represents a zero or a one, depending on if it's off or if it's on. Today we're going to dive in and understand that a little bit, mainly because it's really intriguing, and it's important to understand when we get into our first lessons of programming and really understand what's happening when we write programs. Because ultimately what we're doing when we write a computer program is we're telling the central processing unit what to do, whether it should go look for input from a computer like we did in the last lesson, or if it should output it to a screen, or if it should take some of that input information and store it in memory until we can have time to output it. So to learn this, I found it's best to begin with elementary school counting. And I'm gonna take you back to you know second or third grade when you learned how to count. So we have 10 numbers in our number system. That's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Now when we get to 10 or 11 or 12, we have a bit of a problem because we don't have a number that represents 10 or 11 or 12 all by itself. So we've had to come up with a system of using these 10 characters to represent larger numbers such as 100 or 1,000 or 1 billion. And so the system we do that is called base 10, and you learn this again in third grade, where you have a ones place, you have a tens place, and you have a hundreds place. And so if you have one in the ones place, that's one. But if you had one in the tens place and two in the ones place, that's 10 plus two, which would give you 12. Now when you see this, you think 12 because you've taught your brain and programmed your brain to look at 12 and understand 12. But that's not how it's actually working. You had to learn to compute 1, 10, 2, 1s. The same is true when you get into larger numbers. So if we take the number 125, we actually have to break that down into 5 1s, 2 10s, and 1 100, which is 100 plus 2 10s is 20 plus 5 1s is five, so that's 125. Now a computer only has two characters that it really understands, which is a zero and a one, or if it's off or if it's on, this electrical signal. And so it becomes a question of how can two characters represent all different kinds of numbers? How do we have, how does a computer understand you know, 100 or 125 or a thousand or a million? Well, there's a system similar to the uh, base 10 system we learned in elementary school called base two, which is saying we'll have a ones place. And so here you could have a zero or a one, but if you wanna go to a two, because there's no character representation for two, then we have to extend that into a different place. So this is called the twos place. So if you wanted to write a two, you would have a, you know, one in the twos place, which will give you one, two, and then zero ones. So to show you how that works, the number one would be one in the ones place. The number two would be one, two, which will give you two, and zero ones. Now, if you look at this, your brain has been programmed to think of 10, but it's not actually 10 when you have a base two numbering system. It's one, two, and one, and zero ones. So how would you write three? When you think about that in your mind really quick and try to guess how you would write three. Well, you would start with two and you'd say, okay, I have one, two, and I'll have one, one, and if I add those together, that gives me three. So here's a little test you can go through using that numbering system, that base two, or that binary numbering system. I want you to go and write the following uh, numbers in binary. So stop this video, pause it, 
spend five or ten minutes, go through and remember how to write these. And remember, there's more than just one, twos, and fours. You can carry this on just like you do in regular counting. You'd have a one, a two, a four, an eight, a 16, a 32, a 64, and that could continue on as high as you need to have those numbers. So take a little bit of a break, calculate these up, and when you resume the video, we'll give you the answers and explain how it's done. All right, welcome back. So here's the answers. I'll go through and explain each of these and how we got these answers. So one, it's pretty easy. We talked about this before. In the ones place, there is a one. Now 16 is a little bit more difficult. So I'm gonna start from right and move left and talk about the places. So we have the ones place, the twos place, the fours place, the eights place, and the sixteens place. So this is saying we have one sixteen, which gives us the value of 16, and so we need nothing else. So that's how you get 16. 49, we start with the ones place, the twos place, the fours place, the eights place, the sixteens place, and the thirty-two and the thirty-two place. So you take thirty-two plus sixteen is going to give you forty-eight, and then all you need is one more. So in the ones place, we'll add a one. So if you add those all together, that's what's going to give you forty-nine. Now, as I was teaching this in a lesson the other day, somebody said it's a little bit like counting change when you think about it. If you need to give somebody uh, you know, 62 cents and change, you figure out what the biggest numbers are, like the 25, the quarter, and to give them 62 cents, you would give them two quarters, two 25 cents, which would give you 50, plus one dime would give you 60, and then two pennies would give you 62. So it's a little bit like that. Uh, it, that helped a few people in the class. They actually had come up with that that uh, metaphor or that comparison to counting. So let's go on to 108. So to get 108, we need to start with a 64's place. So working backwards, I have a 1, a 2, a 4, an 8, a 16, a 32, and a 64. So if I do 64 plus a 32, that will give me 96. Now the next place is a 16's place. And if I added 96 plus a 16, that's going to give me 112, which is higher than that. So that's why I have a 0 in the 16's place. In the 8's place, I have 1, so that will give me 96 plus 8, which is 104. And then all I need um, left is a 4, so I have 1 in the 4's place. And it looks like I have a typo here, and I have an 8 there. So, so again, that's uh, 64 plus 32 plus a 8, which gives me 104, plus a 4 gives me 108. So in the last one, 117, similar. So here is our 64's place. So we have 64 plus 32 is 96, plus 16 is 112. Uh, if we add an 8, that would give us 120, so that's too much. So we don't have a, uh, a number there. So we have 112 plus a 4 gives us 116. And all we need to get from 116 to 117 is another 1, which gives us 117. So that's how you would count and represent the number 117 using only two digits, a 0 and a 1, using that base 2 numbering system. So how would you write a negative number? Now we know how to write a positive number. How would we write negative? So we have to come up with a code, a system, to do that. So let's take, for example, negative 3. If you look at this, the system that you understand that you learned in math at some point was if it's a negative, we have this symbol here that represents negative, and then we have the number. And so there's actually two spaces here, but again, your mind is just used to seeing negative 3, and you think and process negative 3. The computer only has a 0 and a 1, and so we don't have that little dash character to represent negative. So what we do is we create this thing called a sign bit, and we'll say if the number is positive, we'll prefix the number with a 0, and if it's negative, we'll prefix with a 1. 
So to write negative 6, you would have a 0 in the 1's place. You would have in the 2's place, you would have a 1. In the 4's place, you would have 1. And so that would give you, this would give you 6. And then you have this symbol up in front, this sign bit, which if it's a 1, that represents negative. And so this is how we would know this is negative 6, because the leading, the leading place right here will tell you the sign, positive or negative, and then the rest tells you the number. So that's how in a computer you would represent negative 6. So let's do a quiz. How about you do negative 8? I want you to go uh, take a minute and figure out how you would write number 8, negative 8, and then come back. All right, so let's figure out negative 8. To get there, we're going to need um, another place in here because we have the 1's place, the 2's place, the 4's place, and we're going to need the 8's place. So in our 1's place, we're going to have a 0. In our 2's place, we're going to have a 0. In our 4's place, we're going to have a 0. And in our 8's place, we're going to have a 1. And then in our sign bit, we're going to have a 1 for negative. So that gives us a negative sign right there. That gives us 1, 8. And I don't need anything else because I already have the 8. So how would you write a decimal, like 3.2, for example? Well, you have to come up with a system for counting, right? We only have ones and zeros, so we need to come up with some type of convention that we can agree upon, a code, right? So we could come up with a system where we say the first four places are going to represent the first number, you know, the first set of numbers or the exponent, and then there'll be an invisible line, and the second four numbers represent the fraction back here. So coming in here, we could say, to get 3, we need 1 in the 1's place and 2 in the, or 1 in the 2's place, so that would give us uh, 1, 2 plus 1, 1 was 3. And then the last 4 would represent the, the number behind the decimal. So here we have, uh, we'll have 0 in the 1's place and 2, or 1 in the 2's place, and that will give us 3.2. So again, all we have to work with here are zeros and ones, but we can start doing really interesting things with representing different types of data using zeros and ones. All right, so let's give you another thing to think about. How would you write a character like, for example, the letter M? How could we take zeros and ones and represent an M? Now in one class I was talking about this, they said, well, what if we took the alphabet which has 26 uh, characters in the alphabet. And we said that M is A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M is the 13th letter in the alphabet. And so we could take the number 13 and represent M. And that could be like our code, right? In the computer, we already know how to write the number 13, but we could tell it, okay, this is representing a character. And so that's exactly what the industry has done. And there's this system of counting called ASCII, which is A-S-C-I-I, -I, ASCII. They've come up with characters for the first 127 uh, digits in the numbering system. So if we look for a capital M, that's here and that says 77. So the value 77 represents an M. Or if we look at a uh, little m, that's 109. So if we think of M, 109, uh, this should be a little m here, equals 109, and then this would be the this would be the representation for an M. Okay, or if we were to say uh, my font won't let oh yeah, there we go. Little m 109. Now a big M we said was 77. So let's write out what the binary for that would be. If we had 164, uh, we'd need 0, 32s. That would be too big. What about 16? 64 plus uh, 16 would give us 80. That would be too high. So we'll put a 0 there. 
So the next space we would go down to is the 8 slot. So 64 plus 8 would give us 72. So that's good. The next slot would be the 4 slot would give us 76. So we'll take that. The next slot would be the 2 slot, which would give us 78. So nothing there. And then the 1's place would be a 1, which would give us 77. So that's how you would take the, these ones and zeros that could represent a number 77 and by convention or by a code that could equal a capital M. So that's what we call data types, right? We have different types of data like characters or integers or decimals that are represented by ones and zeros. And so you could take this uh, this code right here, these ones and zeros, and if it's a character, it's going to represent a letter. If it's an integer, it's going to represent a number, and if you're using a decimal data type, it's going to represent um, a decimal. And the code, the convention that you're going to use, is going to be different for each one. So hopefully that makes sense. Now if we come into the code here that we, we did last time, you'll see these ints right here, these integers. And this is saying that I have a variable that's called age and that's data type is an integer. So it knows when it's reading this data, it knows that this needs to be represented as an integer. And so when you type in your age, if you remember this program, it says, hello world, what's your age? And you give it an age here and you say, you know, for me it was 35. Because it knows 35 is going to be an integer, it will take 35 and the computer will convert that over to its binary representation and then it will store it in the computer's memory in age. Then when you go to print out your age is and you give it age, it reads the ones and zeros and it knows it's an integer and so it converts it back from the ones and zeros into its integer representation of age and it gives you your age is 35. So that wraps up lesson number three. In lesson number four we'll jump into more code and we'll spend more of our time typing code and creating projects than we will on theoretical lessons. But the theory to begin with is really important so make sure you have a, a decent understanding of how binary works and all of the different things we've talked about in lessons one and two and I'll see you soon in lesson number four.